information if you have any specific questions. And then Clark Dietz will provide a presentation uh, on more of the technical side on what we've been looking at. Uh, some of the scenarios um, that we've been looking at as well as some potential costs, um, cost savings, uh, and other things that we're looking at at this point related to solar. Uh, and I, obviously after that there'll be a Q&A as well um, to get some feedback from the public. So um, I know that Bob also wanted to present some information and some pictures to the group. So um, at, at the, after the Clark Beach presentation Q&A then uh, he'll come up and he has some information to present as well. So with that, I guess we could probably get started with um, with Renew. Heather, are you there? Yes, I am here. Okay. Great. Hi there. So we, we have a, a, a decent sized group here. So um, uh, this is Heather Allen with uh, Renew. Uh, if you want to share your screen, Heather, and um, kind of walk us through the information that you have, that would be great. Perfect. Thank you. Sorry, I, went, I actually uh, was just uh, researching a little bit more data on property values and found something cool that I, I want to share with you. That's where, that's where my brain was when uh, you're all tuning in. So let me go ahead and share and tell me uh, how this looks to you. Can you see that? Yes, that looks good, Heather. Okay. Perfect. Well, hi, thank you for being here tonight. Thanks for having me uh, visiting you remotely. My name is Heather Allen. I'm the Executive Director of Renew Wisconsin. We are a small but mighty nonprofit based in Madison, but we work throughout the state. Um, I myself um, have some roots in Wausau. My great aunt raised my mother there. So I have that she they went to Newman High, all my all my aunts and uncles. Um, so I have great memories um, of spending time in Wausau and uh, visiting. And so I'm sorry I couldn't be there tonight, but I just uh, glad to connect with you all. So, um, to tell you a little bit about Renew Wisconsin, we've been around for 30 years. We are celebrating our 30th anniversary this year. We provide support and education around wind, solar, biomass, biogas, geothermal, hydropower, electric vehicles, energy storage, building electrification, and other new emerging technologies that help us transition to a clean energy future. <clears throat> Here's our small but mighty team. A lot of uh, folks with great experience um, working in energy and renewable energy on the team. Um, apologize for the fuzziness of this slide. I just wanted to throw this in here. Um, this is a moment in 2019 when I was on a rooftop in Wasa at Aspirus. Uh, solar ribbon cutting, um, and we awarded them our renewable energy catalyst of the year. That was a really beautiful day. There's so many great projects uh, moving forward. And Aspirus has been a real sustainability leader. I'm sure that folks are familiar with some of those projects. So, overall, um, what I was asked to talk to you about today was energy trends and costs. Um, I'll touch on gas price volatility because that is really in the news right now. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about communities in Wisconsin shifting to clean energy, energy and health broadly, um, how our different energy choices impact um, occupational health, uh, public health, uh, and climate impacts. Um, talk about the utility endeavors to shift to clean energy and why they're doing that, economic benefits for homeowners, manufacturers, industry in Wisconsin, um, and a little bit about common misconceptions about solar farms, as well as jobs, jobs, jobs. So if there's anything that I don't cover, please let me know, and I can um, always answer questions whenever that works for you. So the reason, one of the many reasons 
that clean energy is <coughs> moving forward so broadly in Wisconsin is because communities are really calling for it. Communities are leading the way. 147 Wisconsin communities have committed to 25% clean energy by 2025. And a number of um, counties and towns and cities have also committed to go all the way to 100% clean energy. Um, and uh, Green Bay is among those communities made that commitment. Eau Claire, La Crosse, uh, Fishburg, Monona, there's a, a number, a growing number of communities um, that have helped transition their local governments and the community overall to clean energy. And, and everyone's on a different point on that trajectory. So when we think about energy, um, there are impacts from all sorts of energy production. Um, no energy production has no impacts. <laughs> there, so when we look at it, we can think about it. This is um, from Healthcare Without Harm, which is a medical organization that's focused on sustainability and climate and all the um, environmental impacts of various economic activities, including healthcare and including energy. Um, so what they've done here is put together a chart which I think really tells, tells the story of how certain energy production has higher levels of public health risks, occupational health risks, you know, the folks who are really working on those projects, or harvesting or just transporting fuel for those projects, and then climate impact. And so you can see the, folk, the types of energy that are riskiest in general for the public and for workers and for communities are coal, oil, gas, um, nuclear <coughs> has some like, health risks and some occupational health risks, but many way fewer climate risks, and reduced, you know, reduced um, air pollution risks as well. Biofuels is sort of in the middle of the pack, hydroelectrics in the middle of the pack, and then geothermal, solar, <coughs> and wind um, all have much safer um, aspects when you look at any any impacts um, or any category of impact from those energy sources. So, um, and I can share my slide deck at the end if that's useful. So I think that's just a good place to set the stage. Um, another aspect is where are we really getting our electricity today in Wisconsin? Um, this pie chart that you're looking at represents how um, Wisconsin generates electricity, the sort the fuel sources. So that includes uh, uh, coal is still the number one source of, of and electricity production in Wisconsin. Um, and natural gas is a very close second and becoming a larger source of our electricity generation. Uh, nuclear plays a significant role. Um, and then then you get down into smaller sources of electricity generation, fuel, oil, hydropower, biogas, biomass. Wind produces about 4% of our electric generation mix. Solar, when this chart was created, was well under 1%, or we're right at about 1% now, um, because we've had a number of larger projects um, get built and energized just in the last uh, about 14 months. This is another way of looking at how our electricity generation has changed over time. You can see that coal has become a smaller and smaller portion of electricity generation fuel, and natural gas a larger and larger portion. Um, and these small lines on the bottom uh, represent some of the renewables and carbon-free sources of electricity uh, beyond nuclear. So one of the major factors that is affecting the sourcing of energy, how utilities and homeowners and businesses are choosing to power their, their homes and their uh, companies is, is really the drop in prices. Wind and solar prices have declined dramatically in the last 10 years. Wind dropped 70% um, during that time. And solar, which had a higher price point at that time, at that same beginning point in 2009, has dropped 89% in that same time frame. Um, and so that makes wind and solar extremely competitive uh, on the market. 
uh, for any of you think about generating electricity. So you can look at this chart here. This is what we call a levelized cost of energy. The orange line is solar cost of energy, new solar. Uh, blue line is new wind, and the gray line is new coal. You can see that at that moment in time, um, 2018, coal was more than twice as expensive uh, to generate electricity as wind and solar. And at this point, natural gas was really competitive with wind and solar, right? Right at the same price point almost as wind and solar. However, gas prices are extremely volatile when you compare them to electricity prices. Um, and I think folks are really starting to worry about in Wisconsin heating bills over the over the winter that are coming um, coming to us this season. Uh, Rocky, this is a graph from Rocky Mountain Institute showing volatility of gas prices historically and how right now we're in a significant upswing. Um, and also recognizing that households that can least afford expensive bills will pay a larger share of their income towards uh, energy costs this winter as a result of these gas spikes. One of the nice things about renewables is you are not paying for fuel. And because, because you're not paying for the, the wind and you're not paying for the sunshine. And so those prices, those input prices just do not exist. They do not fluctuate. Um, and they provide a little bit more stability to the uh, electricity generation prices that we all look at. So with all these economic trends, with all these communities calling for renewable energy, uh, clean energy solutions, uh, <clears throat> utilities are also uh, making significant commitments um, to shift to clean energy themselves. And so this is a table. You don't have to read the whole thing. We have this on our website. But um, it just shows you that the major utilities in Wisconsin have all committed to ambitious clean energy goals, um, in part because of the economics, in part because their customers are calling for it, in part because their shareholders are calling for it. Um, but that economic shift, the fact that it's more affordable to produce electricity through wind and solar, really changes the game. Um, and so when the utilities are shifting, um, that changes the market really for all of us. Uh, the way that utilities will are already beginning to, to make that shift is in part through building larger solar and wind farms. This is a map of future solar and wind farms um, coming, um, coming into development in Wisconsin. And you can see that a, a lot of them are concentrated in southern Wisconsin, a few near uh, Minneapolis, a few in, in central Wisconsin. Um, certainly, the further south you get, the more sunshine there is. There's also uh, larger energy demands um, in, in parts of southern Wisconsin, larger uh, population centers. So uh, that's where you're seeing a lot of solar power proposals. These two projects, uh, I don't know if you can see my cursor here, but these two projects in Manitowoc County, these have both been built. They have both been energized. They are both producing power, and this represents at this point, this is representing a good two-thirds of the total solar power in the state. All of the rest of the projects, almost every project that's on this map has not yet been built um, and energized. So these were the first two to become energized, but, but this one right here is probably going to be the, close, the, next, the next one to be fully energized, um, producing 300 megawatts of power. I'm going to pause there. Folks sometimes have questions about this map. Is there any further questions? Okay. Why, I got a question. Why, why don't you have uh, a civil and Fond du Lac? Don't they have a lot of wind farms there in Fond du Lac County? Oh, this this is a map of projects that are just coming under development. So these these just got energized recently. Okay. I have of uh, the existing wind farms that you'll see in a few minutes. Yeah. Okay. Right. Good question, though. So these are. <coughs> smaller scale projects, smaller scale solar farms um, that have been built around Wisconsin. And I wanted to show you, because these are real projects, what they really look like um, in various communities around Wisconsin. Um, and you can see how 
they can be fully integrated into the landscape with, with native pollinator friendly plantings that um, prevent soil erosion and create habitat for um, wildlife, especially, especially pollinators. So, as I mentioned, fuel costs are one of the key reasons that uh, it's economically advantageous to shift to renewables. And in general, if you, if you think about how much Wisconsin is spending on importing fuel every year, it's on the order of 14 to 15 billion dollars a year we spend on importing coal, oil, natural gas, fuel, oil, um, and even gasoline. You add up all of those fuels, we spend billions a year. We send that straight out of Wisconsin. That's money leaving Wisconsin's economy, it's leaving our communities, and it really doesn't uh, help us reinvest in our communities. So one benefit of shifting renewable energy is we will be producing that power locally. We would benefit from the economic impact of producing that power locally, and we would not be sending um, one time costs every year, billions every year out of state. Another benefit of renewable energy is uh, home values actually can increase. There's a common misconception that um, solar on rooftops can actually uh, make it more difficult to sell your home or reduce the value of your home, but there are studies that demonstrate that homes are selling faster and sometimes for more money when they do have already have solar installed. So that's probably not the number one reason people put solar on their homes. I think they do is reduce energy costs. They want to reduce their own emissions. But um, but it's a side benefit, and so it's it's good to know that should. Corporations, every corporation on this um, on this image that we created that we're doing with Wisconsin has operations in Wisconsin, and they have made clean energy commitments. And they've made them for all the same reasons that the utilities have made those commitments. It's because it's affordable and their customers want it um, and they think it's good business. I'd like to share with you a specific example of a manufacturer in Dade County who manufactures um, racking systems and display systems for retail, including Gander Mountain and um, other national chains. That's just a fun background fact, but so it's called Hoffman Manufacturing, and they did a solar installation in 2019, and they, the economics for this project were particularly advantageous. They were able to take advantage of tax credits, they were able to take advantage of uh, um, the, uh, the, there's a business depreciation opportunity that you can depreciate the entire cost of the project in the first year. Um, and as, and the way they financed the project, as a result, their payback period for the project was about will be about 4.5 years, and they installed in 2019, so they're really close to their payback period. Um, and the project itself, over the life of the project, will save them a great deal of money in energy costs. They estimate their uh, return on investment over the 30-year life of the project to be at like 450 um, percent of their investment. So. This is an extraordinarily great financial scenario. Not all projects pencil out this way, but I just want to show you that sometimes the numbers just are so compelling um, that it's really, really, really good for business to uh, invest in renewable energy. And here we have a couple of examples of rooftop solar projects in Wisconsin that are large projects that are kind of they're great snapshots to show you how what kind of investment folks are, are making to renewables. You've got IKEA here uh, on the left hand side of that photo. The top right is American Family Insurance, and the bottom right is the Madison College uh, project on their rooftop. These are these are large projects for scale. Um, these are larger than one megawatt. And I, I think the, the project you're lo looking at, I forget the scale of it, but I think there were three options and one of them was around one megawatt. What you're looking at here with the American Family Insurance Rooftop, that's about one megawatt of solar panels. And here's, um, right here we've got uh, just some detail of some of the larger solar projects and 
uh, where they're located um, in further closer detail. So this is Badger Hollow on the further southwest corner of the state. That's 300 megawatts. And then very nearby, almost a neighboring project, is Richland County Solar Farm. Um, that will be part of the alliance portfolio of solar projects. Um, and then Two Creeks, which I mentioned earlier, that project has already been energized. It was the first very large scale project to get energized to start producing clean power in Wisconsin. Those smaller solar farms that I showed you pictures of, these are on the blend, five megawatt capacity size. Uh, these are, a lot of these are located in the western part of the state, in part because Darien Power was one of the first um, utilities to make a serious investment in small scale solar farms, sort of at that at one to five megawatt range. And wind turbines, we had a question about the Fong Electric uh, wind farm. Um, we do have a number of, of wind projects in this town, and I'll just jump to the map here. And you can see where they're primarily located. The most recently built project is the Bullock Wind Farm in, in Lafayette County in southwest Wisconsin there. And uh, we have one additional project that has been approved for development and is soon to be built. That's in Grant County, so just a little bit further west of that project. Um, we don't have as many wind project proposals as we do solar at the current moment. Um, and when, when projects are built, when projects of a certain size, they have to be over 50 megawatts are built, they can provide really significant economic benefits for the local governments. The local, the utility local aid formula, uh, which is a state formula, sets the uh, revenue generation, uh, the revenue rate at $4,000 per megawatt annually to the county and the townships that are affected by the project or, or they have territory, project territory in the, within their, their boundaries. So if you think about some of the projects I've just shown you, 100 megawatts, 300 megawatts, um, they can generate a lot of new, brand new revenue for local governments. The Badger Hollow project I showed you in Iowa County, that project will generate $1.2 million per year in new revenue um, for local governments. And that revenue is larger than the largest property tax payer in the community, which is not a small one. It's land then, and they're paying about $890,000 a year in property taxes. But this is a brand new store. This is almost like a new land that's opening up. Um, and folks often ask about, well, what do you do after the life of the project? These projects last usually about 30 years. Um, panels have a warranty lifespan of about 25 years in many cases. So at the end of the life of the project, you actually can remove all the equipment, the steel posts can be removed, the panels themselves can be removed. Um, and with the exception of small areas where you would place inverters, um, and you might need to put a concrete pad for the inverters, the rest of the land can be returned to agriculture. And um, we have a number of interesting projects in Wisconsin where they're working on ensuring that during the life of the project, um, you have plantings that are preventing erosion, creating deep root systems, and um, potentially, you know, when the product, all the equipment is removed to get the life of the project, you can go back to agriculture. You may even have, you know, nicely rested soil with better nutrient availability, and it, it, it can really be an, a, a good way for farmers to provide them, themselves, the community, with a cash crop during times of economic stress and yet um, still keep that farm in the farming business, in the farming family for decades um, and can be farmed later after the life of the project. So it's it's an interesting opportunity for agricultural communities. All right, so let's dig into solar vents. I found a great resource and I put the link here. I could put it in the chat um, as soon as I'm done talking. So you can take a look at this. Uh, top five large-scale solar myths. Um, and I thought we just could walk through these because I think they might um, be areas of conversation um, in Wausau right now. 
And the first one I'd like to start with is that solar farms are like factories. Well, we definitely end up the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, which is a government agency of the Department of Energy, disagrees with that, and, and we at Purdue definitely disagree with that. As I just said, um, solar farms are emission free, they're not, they're not, they're not, there are no moving parts except for the trackers, <laughs> but they're not producing any, um, any air pollution or they're not, there are no, there are no trucks, there are very, there are very little people, very few people needed on site to operate, so they're very, they're quiet, um, and they can fit in the landscape, and you can, you can think of them, um, as good neighbors. Um, they're clean and quiet facility. Um, and then the question about glare. This is a fun fun question for us, um, in part because uh, most PV modules use non-reflective glass and they are absorbing light, so they're actually not causing glare issues. Um, and PV modules in general are less reflective than the windows, but I think the most compelling argument to uh, assure folks that there's not going to be a glare problem is that Airports around the country are installing solar projects for their energy use. Um, and if you can co-locate a solar system, a major solar system, with a airport, you know that the glare problem is, is, is really <coughs> not an issue. There is a solar farm at Dane County Airport, and there is a huge one in Indiana. Um, I should have had a picture to show you, but there are some really, really big solar projects co-located with airports. The real benefit, right, is that you've got all this land needed for airports, um, and, and it's a great opportunity to put co-locate the solar there and use the land for two purposes. <coughs> right. Um, the noisiest component of a solar farm are the inverters. So as I mentioned, um, Solar project would, would require you know uh, some concrete pad area where you put inverters. In the Those are the inverters that convert the power so that it can be pushed onto the grid. Um, they they are converting to, um, to to AC power from DC to AC power. So you'll have a real soft buzzing sound, but this is a sound that if you're outside of the project boundary, if you're just outside of it, you're very unlikely to hear and yeah, unlikely to hear it. Um, I have an inverter in my house, I have solar in my house, and I've never heard of sound for my inverter. Of course, it's a very small scale inverter, but um, I've never noticed one uh, myself. Um, there are tracking, there's tracking equipment, so the solar panels, um, if they're on trackers, will rotate to follow the sun during the day. Um, those are also considered extremely quiet. So those would be the main ambient noises you might hear, but they are not they are not loud. Um, so I don't think noise uh, is something to be concerned about with solar. I think it's blessedly quiet. <laughs> uh, so property values. This is a great conversation. So I put a link, I put a link here and I can put it in the chat um, so that it's accessible to you. Uh, or I can email it afterwards, whatever is convenient, um, to a, a fact sheet from the Solar Energy Industry Association, which has a few links to studies. But I actually uh, had a chance right before we were talking to take a look at one of those studies and dive in a little bit. And um, this particular study was commissioned by McLean County, Illinois, on property values. And here's the conclusion of the study, that based upon our examination research and analysis of the existing solar farm uses, et cetera, et cetera, there is no consistent negative impact that has occurred to adjacent property that could be attributed to proximity to the adjacent solar farm. Um, and they confirmed that with county assessors. Uh, there are a number of solar projects in Illinois. They have, they have more than we do um, existing, so there were opportunities to research it. And I don't know how I'm doing on time, but I'd like to dive into this just a little further and share with you just three or four more minutes about this particular study, if that's all right. Yeah, go ahead, Okay, great. 
I'm going to stop sharing for a second and switch to the study itself, so bear with me one moment. <coughs> I'll open that up. Can you see the study on our screen there? Yep. Property value impact study? Yep. Perfect. So this is the study that was conducted in 2018, and I think there is some great stuff here for folks who really want to get deep into it. Um, there's a lot of resources here. So they lay out how they did the study, what solar farms they used for comparisons. Uh, but as you know, there is nothing like there is nothing like pictures to tell a story. So, pictures and then their assessment of um, property area. So, in several of these cases, you'll see that there's a difference between their control area with no adjoining solar farm, the adjusted median price per square foot, and the solar farm um, property areas that are in the test area. Several of these show that. Um, the effect, potentially affected properties actually increase in value. There are a few of these that do show a decrease in value. Overall, it's neutral. But I, I just want to show you a few fun pictures, and I would encourage you to take a look at this yourself, because it's, there's some really big stuff here. Um, so this Dominion in Indy Solar in Indianapolis, Indiana project, here's the solar farm. And here is a house that they're looking at more closely. Oops, sorry. Mm -hmm. This is what I wanted to show you. This is the house. So, the solar farm was built in 2013. It's right here. <coughs> and there was, this was uh, undeveloped at the time. And then three years later, someone built a beautiful estate home which I think right next door, about 150 feet, I guess, that's us. <coughs> and uh, here's the home in detail. It has a pool, an in-ground pool, and attached garage, and it's worth about half a million dollars in 2015. Um, that's what it sold for. So there's a lot of great detail in here. I, um, there is showing you trends. Um, Trends for the control areas that were unaffected by solar farms, trends for the, um, the test areas that were affected, and you can see the housing prices in both categories as housing prices continue, just continue to go up and up. I don't want to belabor the point. You'll see different levels of, um, of impact on various, um, on various uh, test areas. At the end of the report is a summary of all their test areas. And you can see the differences, um, positive, and in a few cases, negative. Um, overall, the average was generally positive, about 1.9%. I can also say, in my, my personal knowledge, is that um, there was a, there was a very, this Badger Hollow project, which I'm very familiar with, in Iowa County, there, were, uh, there was a landowner sort of centrally located to that project who was opposed to the project and did not want to do the project. This is a big project, 300 megawatts. And so they sold, they sold their property. Um, and they sold their property within a month, I believe, of putting it on the market at, well, at over the assessed value. I can't tell you the percentage of the assessed value, but um, they had no problem selling that property. And so I think the anecdotal evidence in Wisconsin, that's not a study. <laughs> But the anecdotal evidence in Wisconsin is good, and there are plenty of studies, so I'll share all those links um, in the PowerPoint and things like that. All right. Um, I had one last thing I wanted to share with you. Um, one last 
We have plenty of deer hanging out in our yard. But when you're talking about a pen on the house, you're not talking about 10 acres. Across the street. 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 There are two houses on Tierney, but the entire block of Tierney is now wide open. We moved in 45 years ago, it was all wooded. So 45 years, it kept on making it look like a tree along Tierney Road. And so we will be literally looking at the solar field. Sure. Every day, I watch that building go up. Every day, I'll rank it to you. And now I'll see solar. Yeah. Is everyone aware that the property in question was zoned residential up to about five years ago? And then the street plots were abandoned, and we were told that the potential was to enlarge the lots for multifamily. Now it's morphed into a solar field. I live right across the street from this. It's going to be 100 feet from my garage on my property. I have trees that are going to shape part of this property for part of the day. I'm not taking my trees down. Uh, this is not good in a residential neighborhood. Every, the intramotion she presented, I agree with 98% of it. I know solar is valuable. There's a place for it. But I didn't see any houses in any of the pictures. I saw panels on roofs of commercial entities. That is impractical. We've talked about that before. But here we are, plunging this in the middle of a residential neighborhood. Does the city have other plans? There's empty space at the tech. Is the solar field practical there? How about some of the schoolyards? There's a lot of open space there. What other plans are there? This is too close to a neighborhood. That's the only objection I have to this. But it's a big one for me because it's going to change my quality of life in a big way. Before before they started that water plant, nobody even knew we were back there. Now it's like a super highway. Yeah, the, the traffic on Tierney is hard. Yeah, yeah. There's two, two families that live there. Yeah. The of the water plant. I mean, it's in there. You show a lot of buildings there. Why not? Why not there? And the tanks too. You could, there's just not enough, near enough space to... Okay, but that would reduce what you'd have to have space for. That old bronze building too. I mean, Where are these panels exactly going to go? On top of the building or in the ground? No, 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 on the ground. On the ground. Then are you going to fill in that one area where you took all the trees down so people that live on Martin Street especially have to look at those ugly things? Yeah, they're supposed to be landscaping as part well, of the process. But I hope they put something high so I don't have to look at those big round cement front things. Eric, where are the inverters going to be located? Um, I guess I'm more towards the center yeah. of the facility. Mm -hmm. These sounds you talked about, they said virtually no sound, yet she talked about well, the panels move, so that makes a sound, and then there's something else, and that makes a sound. Mm -hmm. I mean, is a dog going to go? That's what we're doing. I could jump in there. Those are very, very quiet sounds. You know, the, the well, sounds... If you're 50 feet from them, from them, if you live 50 feet from a field of that, that's going to be quiet? I, I do think so. I, mean, I, have, I have an inverter in my house, and I don't hear it. So um, you'll have more of them. But just like, you know, your refrigerator hums, maybe even your laptop computer, my computer right now is making a really quiet hum. That's the kind of sound we're talking about. This is that not is a sound. No, you're that is not the bigger area you're talking about than a refrigerator. <laughs> I mean, I, you know, like, what would 20 fridge refrigerator sound like? I know the one. I know. I'm not, scientifically, that's not an accurate assessment, but I just, to give you a sense of the feel of those sounds. In fact, ooh, here's the thing I was wanted to say to everyone. I don't know. Um, how, where everyone is located exactly. Uh, 
obviously very close to this project, but um, I think there's no better better experience than experiencing it for yourself. There is a project, um, it's actually a nine megawatt project, so quite a bit bigger than this, that uh, we just visited um, on our on our annual renewable energy bike ride in Fitchburg down here in Dane County. Um, but I think there's truly nothing like just visiting a project of comparable size to see what that looks like, sounds like, and your own experiences. Because oftentimes what we find is that people are surprised at how inoffensive, how seamlessly these things integrate into the landscape once you actually see them in person. We drove by one at the south end of the state recently, and it was surrounded with a chain link fence and barbed wire on the top. That's what the fence was around that solar view. I think you might have options here for the type of fencing, the type of landscaping. So that's, that might be an opportunity to shape the project to be what you want it to be. Yeah. That I, I'm not the developer, so I don't know, but you, you don't, some projects, the projects, the pictures I showed you, those are real projects that do not have chain link fencing, do not have barbed wire. No, because they're in the middle of a rural area or right. in the middle of an industrial park, not smack in the middle of a residential neighborhood, bounded on two sides by residential streets. We don't want to lose the trees, that's what we don't want to build it. We want to build there. Right. I mean, that would, yeah. the sad Do you have any decibel decibel information, any information about how many decibels? I know she said that's quiet, and that's great, but how about some data? I, uh, no. I could get that for you. Um, I could get you um, more detailed decibel level data. So for like a comparable size project, so <coughs> what we would be hearing and at what distance you could hear things? Yeah, I think that's available, and I can, I can look into that for you. Thank you. Right across. After a snow, a big snow, a big storm, or maybe you had a horde of people out there banging on these things to clear them off? No? How about no. Do they self clean themselves? <laughs> how do they do it? We have, we have wet snow here, man. I guess it's storms. Uh, I, can, I can speak to that. I'm sorry. I don't know if ever, people in the room are answering questions, too. But um, in general, Renew and many of the folks we work with recommend that you don't clean off the solar panels because the solar panel is collecting sunlight and will warm up, so it should melt the snow off and the, the panels should be at an angle, especially these panels, they're on a the tracking system, so they'll move throughout the day. So eventually that's coming off. So you don't need to clean them. That's the question. Uh, rain, rain cleans them off for that. I've got a question. Uh, earlier you talked about end of life. You know, pull them up and let's, you know, plant grass and corn and whatever. I mean, are you saying that at the end of 25 or 30 years you just throw these away? What, what, what happens? I mean, what's I mean, in, in our situation here, what happens so, at the end of life? Do you replace them? Do they, all, do they all go to hell at once? What, what happens? Well, over time, they become slightly less efficient every year. <clears throat> and so, um, and, and, and also they are warranted to, to, to just be operational for about 25, 30 years, depending on the panel. Uh, I'm oh, sorry. Um, and so, <coughs> at the end of the life of the project, um, oftentimes what happens is uh, perhaps, I'm not sure, um, I assume the city is the landowner, but the landowner and the, the project developer or owner at the time can decide, okay, at this point we want to remove all the equipment and return it to it, the land to its previous use or we want to do something else with the land. But you'll have, it's a natural break point in the life of the project because the panels will very likely need to be replaced if you were going to continue on with it anyway um, because you'd have more efficient panels um, to put in the system. So, um, you know, because technology continues to improve and the panels that you have will slowly become slightly less efficient every year, but after 30 years, 
whatever panel is on the market is going to be much, much better. So there's a natural inclination to reassess the value of the project at that point. So and yes, you can remove the majority of the equipment, as I said earlier, and do whatever you want with that land. So how are they disposed of? Oh, the solar panels themselves? Yes. Yeah, so solar panels can be recycled. Um, <clears throat> there's a company called Eco Minerals um, that's working with uh, a distributor um, that deals with recycling of different equipment, TRC lighting actually. Um, and we are in touch with both of them to learn about the processes for solar panel recycling. It's much more advanced in California, but there is a facility in Ohio that accepts solar panels and can break them down and use them for other glass, um, glass uses. And the aluminum around the edge of the panel um, can be recycled as well. So those are the main components of the solar panels. So the panels are recyclable um, and can, that can be what you do with them. What's your estimate of the festivals for that? We have, we have animals that are going to be living in the house, dogs, they have their ear periods twice as good as what ours is. How does that going to affect our, our animals that we have? Uh, in the I think you're asking about safety for your pets. Um, yeah, maybe with the what's, the decimal, what, what are you, what's your estimate of the decimal being coming from this? I mean, there's farms all over you know about. What, you must have a number someplace. Yeah, you're asking about decimal levels? Yes. Yes, I will look into that for you. I don't have that at my fingertips. <clears throat> It, it seems to me that many of the comments here have been related to the aesthetics of them. Yep. And, and, and the best I heard somebody said, well, maybe you find something nice around them. Are there any discussions or plans for what the, the, that barrier might be other than a chain link fence with wire on the top? For the sure. Are going to plant them yep. there. They're going to be in everybody's yard. Yeah. Well, I, I think there's lots of options. You know, there's. Um, you, you know, field for, for uh, the butterflies, the pollinators, there's decorative fence that we can put around it. There's, um, you know, other plantings and mounds that we can put um, around it for uh, decorative landscaping. I mean, we've, we've talked about like at the water plant for additional landscaping, like on the east side of the property. Well, you know, once the project is done, the landscaping will be done. That won't be done till next year when the project's done, but, um, and so, and we've worked with, you know, other people. So if they're, um, you know, so if this project ends up moving forward, then those details will be presented with some options, you know, like. Yeah, well, my, my concern is those are candies. On the mm -hmm. corner of Kearney and Buckley is a well. And at mm -hmm. that well, there was one tree. And over the course of about 10 years, they started cutting branches off the bottom, branches off the bottom, so they could mow under it. And lo and behold, all of a sudden the tree is gone. Now what they put next to the well is a, I don't know what a big thing is, a generator, a generator, a large generator that aesthetically is just a big white metal box. Okay. I don't know if there's any intention of refining it around that, treating it a color that brings a little bit to the scenery. That's, that's the concern, is that everything okay. gets so industrial looking so fast. Okay. And then, I understand that I'm, look, the two levels on Kearney Road got frontage on the Wisconsin River that, that really was the last kind of refuge of of wilderness in the city of Wausau, and, and now it's, you know, it's all very industrial. And, and also, we knew that that was a, a sand pit when we bought our, our property. I mean, we mm -hmm. do something else with the hamlet. But I guess I didn't really envision that. I know how many acres that yeah, it's up to of solar hamlet. What did you guess that is acreage wise? Uh, what we're proposing? Yeah. If, if that property is about eight acres. Okay. Yeah. If you know, so if we use the whole thing, which is one of the scenarios, then that would be about eight acres of solar. Yeah. Well, just touch on property values again for a moment. Um, you say if there's solar panels on the house, that increases the value of the house. Well, obviously, that is incorporated into the homeowner's building of the home. But the property value, if us on Tierney Road are upset about having to look at that, if I put my house on the market. I'm expecting other people aren't really going to want to live there either, and I wouldn't get my market value. There's high-end homes along that stretch of 
Tierney Road and down the river that you're plopping this industrial, you know, we got the facility already, now the panels. People are going to say, I'm not living there, let's not even go look at that house if it goes on the market. That's what we mean by property values. We don't mean the house that somebody builds that they want solar and solar is, we're not saying we don't like solar. We, just, we didn't choose to have it in our neighborhood. We don't want it across the street from us. We don't want to be looking at it every day. It's, it's not a neighborhood friendly project. project. You know, we, have, we absorbed the, and supported having the water treatment facility there because it was desperately needed and it benefited the whole city. But we had no idea they were going to sneak this in. You know, it felt a little bit like a bait and switch. It was never mentioned up front. I, I guess, you, you know, when you talk about sneaking it in, I mean, the public information meetings we had with the water the treatment plant, yeah, and we talked so about the potential for, it. oh, absolutely it was. There was even questions about it. There was questions about it and it was said it was. And how, how long were those meetings? Um, when did we start that? 18 and 19, I believe? Yeah. So, yeah, it was mentioned. It wasn't part of the project at that time. No, be, be, so right. It because, wasn't. but it was talked about that we were going to look at this. So, um, this, this is an opportunity for the city to start moving forward. What's if, that? If I could um, also address that, that vital comment as well. I mean, I think. You brought up a few a few things, so let me just make sure I got them all. Um, so I was addressing a couple different types of property value impacts. So the real, you know, the real question about property values um, hangs on whether or not somebody would buy that house, right, and at what price point. And what that data is showing is that it's neutral or better than expected. Um, for neighboring properties of solar projects of a significant size. Your project's actually quite small compared to the projects um, in that particular study I was showing you. But I think um, I think it because it may not have been expected, uh, much like a water treatment center was not maybe expected when you first moved in there, but um, those other aspects of, of the the other project that is critically needed and vitally, vitally important for the city. I mean, this could have a serious economic benefit to you all who do pay property taxes um, to offer city services. You know, reducing your expenditure on energy is a significant, that's a significant support for your city budget and your city costs and your property taxes. So um, I think that the studies do show folks will buy those homes, even nice homes in nice neighborhoods, because some people, like people like me, love looking at solar panels, and I know that's just a personal preference, <laughs> yeah. but in my case, in my case, I look at my solar panels, and I, I see people looking at my solar panels and starting conversations with each other about solar energy, clean energy, emissions, climate, um, saving money, being energy independent, there are a lot of great fun things. It's a new technology. Um, it's a clean technology. It can help create jobs. There are a lot of benefits. So it, there are people who like looking at solar, if you can believe it. And some of those photos I showed, um, where you have the plantings, and you can have you can have vegetation screening. You can have whatever kind of fencing you want, depending on all the details your city and your developers are explaining to you. I'm not involved in the project, but I think there are options that can make it pleasant or at least less disagreeable than it feels like it will be because I, I do understand it's a big change but there are real economic benefits. I think your grandchildren will thank you for this because it's an investment in their future and um, I just think there's a lot of value here that, that is worth you know any community, my community, um, to consider. Yeah, back. Hey, I'm, I'm all for solar development. Don't get me wrong, it's a good idea. But which would you rather look at? I'm biased, I have to admit. Woods and trees or a solar field? I mean, it's pretty simple. This is so close to everybody in our area. Um, you know, the things that you showed on the, on the overhead um, was fine and dandy, but they're not right there. We're all right there. Um, 
I mean, if we can move them away, move them the other side of the plant. If you remember a couple of years ago before the plant was built, we had a big old meeting down here, and the whole thing was this whole plant was going to it was going to just meld into the neighborhood. And to say that it did a pretty good job of that, I don't mind it. But this is taking it just a little too far and bringing that that close. And now we got those big cement things right there next yeah. to um, this road. You know, if we could put some on the roof, put some to the north, put some, I, I don't know. I, I, I don't know all the options, mm -hmm. but could it be possible to relocate that field somehow uh, to get it away from the streets? I mean, between Bugby and, and Tyranny, I mean, it, it's right there. And I don't care what you do with it, if you put a nice fence around it and you do this and that, but you're going to have to only go so high anyways because you want to have the sunlight coming in, right? So you can't go too high with anything. How tall are the panels? Like 14, like 14 uh, feet to the top. Usually the whole system is not going to be more than uh, 10 feet high total. So one of the studies I was looking at likened it to sort of the, the visual impact of a greenhouse. Um, we were talking but about they're tracking, so they... I, I think we could, I mean, if um, if you have more questions for Heather, that's fine. I mean, we could get into Clark Dietz's presentation yeah. at, at this point for the yeah. uh, specifics the project. of the, of the project. One question I have is that if you're in the life on the panels, what, what is the uh, definition of end of life on the panels? From what I read, it was 75% on four, 75% output on four out of five panels. Is that a end of life criteria? Could someone re repeat that question? I'm sorry, I was having trouble. Yeah, sure. Heather, so he's asking like at, at the end of life of the panels, um, is that really determined by like if it's 75% um, efficient at that point? Is that typically or, yeah? Right. Yes. That would be a typical rate of efficiency reduction over the like two and a half to three decades. Yes. Okay. And once you get to that point, you can still generate electricity. In many cases, what will happen is maybe a commercial user of a solar panel will decide, oh, this is just not the most efficient panel anymore. And they'll give it away, and somebody else can use it and generate electricity. But it is, it's, it's, it's uh, economically advantageous at that point if you're if you're trying to sort of make make money and make and make it economically sound to put on new panels, even though it's a new expense, because they will be more efficient. And you're talking about two decades hence, three decades hence, where the technology, the panels have continued to become more and more efficient. So. A new panel three years from now will be more efficient um, by a long shot than what I have on my house today. And so it may well make sense for me, if I wanted to, to swap out my panels for new panels um, at that point as well. So yes, that is very likely that is often what happens. In fact, I have a friend who's a solar installer, but they have access to solar panels and they can just put them on the roof, right? So there's no very little cost to, to, to doing this for them. But they've swapped out panels that they've had for five years just because the new panels are so efficient. You only do that if you want to, but yes, that's the trend, like definitely 25, 30 years after you've installed your panels. It just makes economic sense to swap them out. Heather, thank you for coming and sharing with us. I just wish you could send some Pittsburgh water down here so we'd all share your enthusiasm. <laughs> my pleasure. It was my honor. Um, my great aunt worked in the battery factory in Wausau. I don't know if you guys know where that is, but um, so I understand living near industrial things or things that feel industrial but were important for various reasons at the time. And um, I understand that delicate balance, and I appreciate your time. And um, I hope you all have a great night. Thank you for bearing with me being remote. Thanks, Heather. Yeah, see you later.
Yeah, we're going to set up so if, if somebody needs to use the restroom or stretch or take a little break. Do we? Um, I'm Tanya Westfall with Clark Dietz. Um, uh, my colleague Lisa Zard is here. Um, I'm a civil engineer, uh, shareholder of the company, and sit on the board of directors for Clark Dietz. Lisa's an electrical engineer. Um, and, and, and I'm a civil engineer, so we'll both speak to, to the various portions of the project. So today we're going to talk about um, kind of a recap of where the project has um, come since its inception. We had a, a little bit lengthier version of this at the last commission meeting. We took a few things out of here, but in essence is what the commission saw. Um, a, a couple weeks ago. Um, so there's a few things that Heather covered that we had covered a couple weeks ago in this presentation. So I'm going to skip through some of that a little bit quickly. Um, if you want me to slow down, please stop me. Um, but I know we're a little bit tight on time and we want to give you guys an opportunity to ask some more questions as well. Um, so uh, we'll get rolling. So today we're going to cover a little bit more on the overview and benefits of solar. Um, I'll talk about the project background in particular for this project. We'll look at the basis of design and some of the solar array sizes that we've looked at. Um, talk a little bit about funding and project costs and then the next steps in the process. So um, in terms of how does the solar photovoltaic system work, um, again, I'll skip through this a little bit quickly, but what we're looking at is a single axis tracking so solar um, PV system. So when you see PV in here in the presentation or in other locations, it's a photovoltaic system um, made up of cells um, that are part of solar modules that make up the array. So just for reference, one kilowatt hour um, equates to running a one 100 watt light bulb for 10 hours um, and these <coughs> other two examples, just, just so you're aware of um, the relative scale of things and um, power usage. So it's just an example. This is something Heather went over, so we'll skip through that. Um, again, some more benefits of solar. Probably the biggest thing in terms of what we'll talk about here on a more technical side have to do with um, the low maintenance side of things um, and the, the generation of the, the solar facility itself. So here are a few other facts. The one that sticks out the most to me is that 50% of, of new energy in 2019 in the U.S. came from solar. So it's, a, it's an indicator of um, the economic benefits of solar and how things are changing. So here's just a graphic that shows um, behind the meter. So if you remember when Heather was talking about there are inverters and it converts the DC to the AC, um, everything on the left in this graphic uh, from the inverter is what we're talking about in terms of this array. So that's the, um, the, the PV system that we're talking about. Here are some examples of construction um, and some installed systems. The point here is, an, is also something Heather made the point of that the warranties on this type of infrastructure are much longer than other infrastructure at 25 years. Um, pretty typical, though even the workmanship Warranties tend to be five years, and then inverter warranties are at 12 years. All of these are longer than most other infrastructure um, that we deal with. This is just a sample of monitoring um, the system. There are many different ways to do that, but last time we were here, there was a discussion about usage of um, usage of the electricity and when and how that gets done. And this is a tool to help with some of, of how, how it's used and when it's used and optimizing the system. Here's, this is just an example. This isn't related to the project at hand because the project hasn't been fully defined yet. But this is a, a graphic or information we could put together if this project were to move forward and, and people can understand the impacts it has um, in the area. So as far as the background of the project, this first graphic you see here was a, a request when the project started. So that pink rectangle below those um, oval shapes is where the new drinking water plant is now. We did explore areas to the north of the plant um, and did some test pits in those locations. And there's a lot of buried debris up there, um, not just um, rock and other things that are excavatable. There's, 
metal debris, there's uh, um, unsuitable materials. Most of the construction here happens with driven piles um, and th these areas are not suitable for that. There's a couple other things that happen there. There's a large stockpile of material that uh, of aggregate that's been recycled from the water treatment plant and then because of some of the underground areas at the water treatment plant, their stormwater basin moved a little bit to the north and sort of encroached in some of these areas. D did you have a question, sir? No. Um, so that being said, we had to do some exploration in some other areas, and that's where the bug bee site came up, being adjacent to the, to the new treatment plant. Um, and we focused our efforts on what would a concept look on the bug bee site. So it, it, it fit uh, what was desired at the beginning of the project in terms of size. It's about seven acres usable area. It was located within the city. Uh, it's adjacent to the new water plant. And what that means, it's proximate to the user of the power that would be generated. The topography is, here is gentle, unlike the topography to the north that had some water features and some steep slopes. Um, and then prior to purchase of the property, the city did a phase one environmental site, site assessment and some um, subsurface investigations and there was n nothing of concern on that site. So what we did is move forward looking at to maximize that site. And those of you who were here last time saw this graphic to the right, which is this one. And there's a board here that we brought last time showing that. Um, this was brought here to get feedback from, from all of you, and um, the feedback was this is a little too disruptive to our neighborhood. Um, oh, wait, maybe this was way too disruptive to our neighborhood. In particular, the proximity to the roads in your homes. So what we did um, at the request of the Waterworks Commission is look at some other scenarios um, for... Oh, I'm a little off track here. For size um, and generation and related cost. So this, I'm gonna go back and forth a little bit here for the sake of time as well. This is the smallest array we looked at. And the reason that this size was selected was because this array in general can handle, um, can generate power that the water plant would use and nothing more other than, you know, he, yes? How big is that area? Ooh, yeah. do you know that, Lisa? I don't know. Yeah, so this is, the whole site is seven acres. This array itself is sitting at less than six acres of that entire, well, it's about six acres. So the, the largest one, so I went back to the largest one here, the one that's, um, so that's probably a good estimation. I mean, there are some access drives and some, some gravel roads surrounding the perimeter, so um, maybe two acres. Does that take a lot of the trees or not? This is showing no, no tree removal of the existing trees. So if you look to the, I don't know if I can point on this. You can see my acre. Do you have my an pool. overlay of where this, where this is in relationship to the new buildings? Um, yes, uh, I don't know. We have it in here. We we have them on the boards. Okay, that's the board. So everything, all the buildings are closed. Correct. Are you so? Uh, can you see my cursor at all here? This is the. Ex these are the existing trees that are there now. All of this. Where my cursor is now is that well house building. So this is, and this is Tierney. And this is Buggy. So this is a mid-size array that we looked at that still maintains um, all of the trees in place. How far, what's the distance from Buggy to the southern edge of the array? Well, So I don't know the answer to that specifically, but I could probably make an educated guess here. Is that right of way a 60? It looks like you're okay. Correct. So if you look at where my cursor is again, between your road right of way, so the distance between here and here, 
is generally 60, 66 feet. So you're probably 60, 120, you know, 300 feet to this western edge of this one. Um, that's the medium sized one. Now, um, these are on here basically just to show how much space they could take up. These aren't fully vetted layouts for either of these sizes. It, it's just a matter of coming back here, having something that looks like the right scale to get your feedback. Um, because again, the commission listened to what you said last time and asked us to take a look at these so that you had an opportunity to respond to something other than the, the maximizing the space. Um, so now that you've seen those, I'll go back a little bit in terms of what we talked about in sizes. So this array essentially would have all of its electricity used by the plant. Um, and I, we can get into more detail if you guys are interested in that, but I'll, I'll just run through it here real quickly. This one would not necessarily use all of the electricity produced when it gets produced, because you, have, you think about when the electricity is produced, it's, it's sunny, um, it's during the day, and it's not necessarily all needed at the plant. Some of this um, involves a sell back to the utility. The large array, or, or anything a little bit smaller than this one or a little bit bigger would also include some, some buyback. Um, this is the biggest size, again, just shown as you've seen before. So we'll quickly run through a little bit of the, the cost scenarios and what we looked at for funding. So um, the April, June timeframe, uh, NatureWise was looked at under as a WPS program that the city looked at with WPS. Um, there is an option to fund solar projects in as a third party, and I think that was something that was asked about here last time. Um, right now in Wisconsin, third party entities, private entities, are not allowed to own solar generating facilities and sell the power back to you. Um, so that one hasn't been looked at here. Uh, so the focus of this was to look at the um, city owned arrays and potential cost scenarios for that. Have to push Are you saying that the two, two miles on the left, the small and medium, would not involve cutting any trees down? The they probably side? would not. Well, <laughs> that's what they said. Close enough. Yeah. yeah. For now. Well, I, if I had to say with certainty if it could happen, if they could go in there um, without cutting trees, yes, there's a way to arrange those in there. But, but I don't get to make those decisions, so I'm cautious in, in my choice of words. So, so I think sorry. the question people are really asking is how, how do people who are interested in advocating for the smallest option that would prevent the fewest loss of trees and have the smallest array, where do people go to advocate for that? How does that occur? I think that's now, really. Yeah. Oh, let's vote. Oh, let's vote. <laughs> you want to show us the evidence? Well, I mean, I think people are, I think people have made it clear that they have concerns. People that live in the neighborhood and will have the opportunity to look at this on a daily basis would like to have it remain more aesthetically pleasing. I understand that our presenter loved, not you, <laughs> I'm pointing to the big screen. Um, she likes looking at solar panels, and that's great. Um, I think solar is a great idea. I think a neighborhood solar array is not as great of an idea, Agreed. aesthetically. So, okay, so can we, how do we express that aside from people have said it over and over? Do you want to vote? Do you need written statements? What, what is it that needs to happen so that it's not, okay, we let the neighborhood speak, they spoke, but the decision's already been made. Because I think you're, that's part of the concern. People think that this maybe comment, has been decided. Yeah, your, your comments that you're providing tonight, there's notes being taken, and they'll be presented to the commission on December 7th on what your concerns are, what you'd like. You know, what I'm hearing from it, you know, the group, from the neighbors, is that you want to keep the trees along Buckley. Yeah. So, and add some trees along Terry. And that's great. I, I, I think so. You and know. If you I mean, if you're asking what would be ideal right. for, in my opinion, that's it. Right. And then I think, though, that you, you know, 
And we'll present that to the commission because the commission is ultimately the one that's going to have to decide and make the decisions moving forward, right? And, and so I think that if obviously the large size solar array, it, I, I would assume the commission is probably going to take that off the table, but you know, that will be presented to them as well as it was at the last meeting. And so, but based on the comments, but then, you know, some additional, um, information about the you know the small size versus the medium size you know if we can keep the majority of the trees along bugby to keep that screen if we can do the landscaping on the east side for tourney you know there's i'm sorry tyranny then you know i th i think that you know you know there has to be some economics for that too you know for the users throughout the city uh, and so i think that economically if the medium size is, is a better fit, um, you know, I, I think those are the things that maybe the commission would want to hear. Like, you're, you're, you want the aesthetics, you want the trees left, you want uh, potentially trees planted on the east side, you know. And so what can we put in there and what would you be okay with, um, you, know, you know, if we put a solar array in there, um, is, it, is it okay to, yes? Well, I guess I'd also like to know, you know, the unbuildable north side, okay, whatever studies you've done and junk that's buried there by forever. <laughs> Have you done a cost estimate to, you know, see what you need to do to possibly get rid of whatever's buried there to, I mean, it's, other than saying, uh, it's just not going to work, and you looked at it as an option. Because certainly there's a lot more room to the north to do a bigger array. Yeah, so we did that on really broad, round numbers, um, and it's significantly more. How and much it, significantly? Dollars and cents? Well, it really depends on which thing you would, which size you choose for, for, for what. Um, Is the land in the city of Wildside Company? That's city property. Yeah, yeah. Well, just to the just to directly. Yeah, that's to the right. Land. There was one kind of water between Maine. The the property to the north that you're talking about is the village of Maine. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So yeah. this is north of the plant. So yeah. this is that's the very uh, north side. So that's another issue. At the north end there, you are at the property limit. The yeah. Property you want. The city limits, yes. City limits. Well, we this the utility owns the property to the north, but it's in the village of Maine. Does that matter? Yes. Yes. For um, zoning tax reasons. No, for for zoning and permission to do this type of work uh, in this, you know, these facilities. Yeah, the village would have to approve the project. Is that an option? Sure, I've, I've talked with the administrator in the village and stuff. They're they're willing, you know, to take a look at that. Again, the issue comes down to the economics. It's I mean, there's more no, expensive. There is no revenue to the town of Maine. Am I correct? From the city of Wausau? Uh, I don't believe so. Not, the city's not paying property taxes to the town of Maine. No. So you know, it sounds like an excellent opportunity to remediate that site if there's there are problems with that site. I mean, if we're talking about putting a, you know, you could you could take take that area that's unusable and, and put a solar array on it. Why wouldn't you pursue that over taking down a whole grove of trees that everybody in the neighborhood loves? Sure. So and I also, the other thing with that is that that group of trees, as small as it is, made the water plant more palatable to us mm -hmm. when we first looked at you know, where it would go. You know, because it's not, not the most aesthetic looking building in the world now that you can see it. And it looks a lot better behind those trees. It does. So I, I'll just um, answer this real quick and then we can. Is it, um, the commission meeting is open to the public, I guess. Mm -hmm. So as far as the land to the north, it's not just about sur subsurface conditions. There's a pretty large pond to the west that um, you can't necessarily see on this laptop. These aerials are not current as of today either. There's also some debris piles on there, and I, I, I don't know the history of those, but it's 
um, construction waste and that's above ground as well. And so just from what you're, you're saying, is it possible that would be, um, you know, could be wind power there? Because again, what you mentioned, the ground really isn't anything that people want. I mean, it would seem like wind would be, I don't know if you've looked at that. Wind was not part of uh, the scope of this. Right, I kind of realized that, but I just wondered if you had looked at it, there was a reason that it's, you know, it's just not being discussed right now. So in terms of if land is usable or not usable, I mean, I, any piece of land is usable given the right amount of money, right? So there's a feasibility piece of it when we look at it and normal construction practices and if it becomes suitable or not suitable and um, at some point you sort of set that aside because it's not suitable for building something like this. Could you build something there? Certainly you could. Uh, but there's cost benefit analysis with that. And well, maybe potential federal infrastructure dollars that are out there to become available. Um, is it a little early to rush into this with, with not knowing what, what that might provide to the I, d I don't think it's too early to rush into it. I think that you know what we'd like to do is get to a point to where um, when those dollars become available, we could apply for them immediately. You know, so we, we're not exactly sure, you know, what avenue we have to take to access those dollars yet. That hasn't been provided out, but and we, we have a number of projects in the city that we're looking at trying to get to the point to where they would be ready to apply for these dollars once they become available. Um, and so I think this would be a great opportunity for that, you know, if, um, if we could put something here that the community would be amenable to. And I think it would be benefit citywide for the users. The other thing you said that confused me still about this, when we've been in the house for 45 years, and what I think you're talking about is being unsubstantial structure was really a hole in the ground when we moved in. I would, people say, where do you live? I say, I look across the street from Paula Bowles' bar. Well, Paula Bowles was on 6th Street, but it's across the street on Jeremy Road now. That was part of the bill. Oh. Yeah. You, you know, and that's what went in there. <laughs> yeah, so uh, the city staff did eight test pits out there. So they used a backhoe excavator and got 10 feet or so decent size hole. Um, and it's apparent that it's filled material. Most of it is good granular material. There are some smaller pieces of asphalt in there that were encountered. Um, in the, the other areas we looked at, there were many other things. Um, Re-rod, concrete, large, you know, car si small car size pieces of waste. I'm, I'm and that wasn't encountered on this site. Could there be pockets of that? Sure. Um, but in, in eight different test pits around that property, it, it, it looked pretty good. I have a question about um, going back to uh, the size. Um, you said that maybe a, a mid size or a smaller size array would be more palatable. But we were told that when this was coming in, that those trees would have to come down, the original plans, the trees would have to come down because they were too tall and the sun needs to come in to get, you need to be able to get the sun on those panels. Yeah, so there's... So if you move them back, even if you just make it a smaller array, how are you going to keep the trees? You know, I just don't understand. Now you're saying you can keep the trees if the array is smaller and back farther? Yeah. You know, that, it just seems to me if they had to come down before, why didn't they come down now? So earlier we were looking at maximizing the whole piece of property. So these are the, these are the trees we're talking about here that exist now. So this is the current tree line. Um, and we had, put in a, maybe a 25 foot setback from the right of way last time. So all of this space right here is not being used. I mean, it would be feasible to shrink this up, move this over, still keep a buffer in here if needed. Um, we would just need sort of a net sock area that looks like this. Um, there's a shading analysis that does for, that's done for trees. Um, so if you think about a 40-foot tree and the sun coming over, it has a certain amount of shade it produces. 
the, the panels get moved back away uh, where they need to be from the shade of whatever vegetation is there or building or something else. Um, so all of that is done during project development and then you see all of the, the layout of this tighten up a bit on what it really would be. Um, so here we're looking for, and correct me if I'm wrong, the goals of the project. Um, and I think what we're hearing is um, there needs to be screening along Bugby and along Tierney. Um, the extent of that screening is to be determined. Is it existing trees? Is it a combination of new landscaping existing trees? Is it fences? Is it decorative fences? Is it not? Um, there needs to be a fence around the, for safety reason, there needs to be a fence around the array um, of some sort. So what you're saying is those trees may still have to come down to some degree? Um, not necessarily. I think there's space here to do a smaller project if that's something that the commission um, feels is the direction to go. So Tony, are you saying, saying that this could just morph into more, something here. more to the north? Right. Yeah. Um, this land is available as well. This is in the village of Maine. Um, but it, we could pursue this area. This is, as you can see, this is water. So mm -hmm. we want to keep a setback from that because this is electricity. It's not the same as putting something else there, but, but originally if you look, I don't know, it was one iteration before that one, we had some yeah. panels. Well, is there a negative effect from doing what you're saying and going farther north? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. It really just administratively, yeah. if we were to yeah. this area. And so, so we have opportunities to use this entire area. Okay. We're showing this as just a matter of the area it takes up. Okay. Um, and then as we, as the project gets developed, so we'll develop and we look at the tightening the layout down, tightening the cost down, the funding opportunities available, we can put something together that's a little more solid. And, um, well, I think, I think most people would be out there. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think one down yeah. some almost one or two or have it go farther north. I think the, the biggest concern is not going to know those trees. Yeah. And then having that view of the water. Well, and as Eric mentioned, there's a responsibility for the city to put put a project together that considers the you know the fiscal side of this for the entire city as well, while taking it under consideration the neighborhoods with references. And How much fiscal difference would there be if you can move that straight north? That is an area that is not cluttered with you know junk cars and dead bodies. What would the fiscal Are you trying to tell me something? <laughs> <laughs> you guys took out so much junk for the, the buildings that you have now, I guess I have a hard time believing that you're saying you can't do it, you know, additionally, you know, or you know, whatever else is left there, but using this, you know, mid-size array or whatever right now. And, Correct me if I'm wrong, you're saying you can't move it north, it's just that it goes into the village of Maine. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, right. This this piece would this smaller piece like up in here, I believe, is, is was kind of determined that we could use this. Use this section. Push it back. If you right. need to take the village of Maine board members out for dinner to get it <laughs> We'll let you take them all for dinner. <laughs> so some of the difference. <laughs> some of the difference. So this, I didn't do this project. That was a different consulting firm. But this project is a forty-two million dollar project or something like that. So when you look at cost benefit to a project of this size to excavating uh, unsuitable materials out when you already have to excavate maybe for very large tanks. It's a very different analysis than the construction method here, which is um, minimally impactful in relative terms. So something like this. Okay. The plan seems like you want to have everything contiguous. I'm wondering if there's a real loss of efficiency or financial wisdom if there would be clusters could move some of this maybe and have 50 here and 50 there above it and still keep a large number of panels but not have them all in one gob. Do you need them to be in one gob? You can do whatever you want. 
it just takes money. So it would take a little more money to have multiple areas um, because you need, at least as the expert on this, as the electrical engineer. But yeah, you'd have more conductor length running from your array to your array to your array. You so. that once. Mm -hmm. Now, with rooftops being considered at all, in addition to, say, you put the smaller setup up there, and then you use the roof, uh, you've got two pretty good sized buildings there. I, I mean, uh, was that looked at at all, or is that in, in any kind of works, you know, to add to whatever array you want to put out on the field? It, it wasn't, because, I mean, in, in, the, in the scheme of a solar array, it's not big. I mean, you know, like you... Uh, so it but, can't be additive to that other array? I, I, w I would say no, it wouldn't be significant enough to, you know, be... Because you've got all kinds of different voltages there, too, in your plant. You got 277, 480, I'm sure, and then you also have 12208, you know, for office. I'm, I'm assuming, I don't know, that there's transformers being put in, uh, items like that. So um, you would have different voltages uses also. Yeah. Uh, sure, um, but all that power just has to be converted to AC and then it. it right, it's and also it has to be three things, right? To phase up the you got. So you have different buildings, that's why I thought you might have an opportunity to also do that with the rope tops, because it seems to be a waste of space to be the rope tops. So oftentimes, um, just in general, land development of an array is more cost effective than rooftop development in, if you have land available. Um, now, we didn't look at this, and we're, well, that wasn't part of our scope to look at this in this project. Yeah. Um, I would venture against the, the roof systems aren't uh, designed very full for this. And they're, mm -hmm. relative, they're relatively small amount of roof area available. So what is the I, size I think you had the someone over here who's been waiting a long time to see something. Mm -hmm. with, with the brownfield uh, funding, I mean, the brownfield funding with the um, infrastructure bill, is there a chance that could, you could actually use some of that funding for the north side and put the solar array up, up there? Granted, you have to check with, with me, but could that be a possibility um, for funding and having less problems with having it near people's? Yeah, I'm not, I'm not quite sure. If, if that would be available for that. Um, I, I think one of the, you know, the, the challenges with the site to the north, there's a reclamation plan for it because it's under a mining permit, right? And the, and the city took that over when we purchased, when the utility purchased that property. And so, um, you know, I, I'm not saying that a solar array couldn't be put on there. Um, how they're installed with driving piles and stuff like that, it, it, it won't be feasible. Uh, you know, up there right now with what we found under the ground. Because we aren't going to be able to get those piles down. You know, they aren't going to be able to drive those. Um, but, you know, that property to the north, you know, hopefully at some point it will be ready for redevelopment, other use, whatever it is, but it has to be what they call reclaimed first. And there's a plan for that, but the utility, you know, hasn't begun to do that at this point. And, um, and I would say it's a long-term plan. Which utility are uh, Wasso Waterworks, yep. Do you have numbers on the, like, the payback for the largest of the arrays? Is that the problem? We could probably, yeah, we haven't quite got there, but we can probably move forward and get into that. Lisa, it's... It'd be interesting to know, you know, if it's 10 years for the small and 12 years, Stay tuned. Um, okay, so with the 
couple sizes of arrays that we were looking at here, um, we took a look at, at a number of cost scenarios. And in order to do that, we needed to make some assumptions. Um, they're listed here. Um, we, we stayed relatively conservative with them. Um, you know, borrowing term of 10 years at 2.5%. Um, we do have some scenarios where we're going to utilize some grant money, and we're assuming a million dollars for that. Um, we're assuming the city is not eligible for tax credits. Um, and then there's some escalations we used on the electric rates and the sellback rates. So this first graph here um, shows the cumulative net return for the three different size options. So the blue line is the smallest array, and the red line is the middle size, and the green line is the largest array. Um, so a couple things to note here. Our trend goes negative initially, and the reason for that is because the loan payments are larger than the savings. Um, at the 10-year mark, when that loan is paid off, then we start to see the savings from the array. And so that line trends in a positive direction. Where that line crosses zero is when the array will start to see a cumulative net positive return. Um, so to note on this one, the two smaller sizes don't get there within our 30-year expected life expectancy. Um, the largest size comes in around 25 years. Now this um, next graph assumes that we're going to put a million dollars of grant money into the project. So um, one thing to note here is that the, the shape and the relative um, comparison between the lines stays the same. It's just shifted because we're putting a million dollars into it. Um, but you'll see a much more favorable um, outcome here. So our smallest array, the blue line here, um, we start seeing savings right away. Um, and it just goes up from there. The medium-sized um, array, we start seeing savings at year five. And by 10 years in, um, we're getting a net positive cumulative return on it. Um, and then it's 10 years and 15 years for the largest array. So um, the takeaways here um, are that you know your largest array is going to be your largest initial cost, but it also has the largest potential return. And that's mostly due to um, the economy of scale for your construction cost. On the opposite end is your smallest array. Um, basically, you have your smallest initial cost, but your smallest potential return. And then that middle size array kind of sits in the middle, kind of balances out both of those. This one's yours, Eric. Yeah. Um, Why are we looking at 30 years? That's the life expectancy of the array. We were just told the life expectancy was between 20 and 25 years. A 25-year warranty period, 30-year <clears throat> life in general? And that's not what I read about it. I was more in tune with the 20, 25 years, which is what she said. So that information well, comes from. Years, yeah. So we we partnered with a solar developer on getting some of the cost information here, um, re replacement information, O and M cost, um, and I, I can with certainty tell you that their period is 25 years, and they plan for 30 if they're owning their own array. So um, I, I think it's a solid number. Perhaps she misspoke. I mean, they're the number one solar installer in the state of Wisconsin, and they work throughout the, the country and the, quite a bit in the Midwest. So I, I feel okay using that number. In fact, you could probably get a get generation from that facility even after 30 years if you put a little bit of money into it. Well, I already used 
efficiency, of course. Yeah. Right, but if you were to change out the panels um, to some higher efficiency <coughs> panels, you already have the racking system in there and the electrical infrastructure, so um, it's just it's one piece of the cost of it. That's why I was looking at the 10 years, where you were at 10 years, Yeah. because you can imagine what the panels are going to be like in 10 years, and that might be all changed. So these graphs, they take into consideration the degradation of the panels over the years? And also built into that is an O&M cost, which includes an inverter reserve. So yeah. if inverters would fail or something, they could be replaced. That's all built into these numbers. Okay. So the efficiency of the inverters is all included. Correct. Where are these panels manufactured? I mean, you, does this go out whatever option you choose? Does this go out at RFP? Or you say, well, I'm going with ABC solar panels, or how, how certainly you, you, you're basing costs and warranties on guessing something specific that's out there. But it's maybe, maybe in Wisconsin, or maybe in the United States, or maybe China, or where's the money going? The short answer is not made in Wisconsin. Um, and made many other places. Okay. So it's safe to say that, you know, I think we have to talk about a couple of things here with the next step process. It's safe to say that the largest array in the proposed location is a non-starter. And now this is the second time we've been told by the neighborhood that that removal of the trees along Bugby and the array that large is a non-start. So assuming that um, we can work with, or we can all live with, um, either the smallest or the medium size, assuming the tree removal um, isn't happening, and assuming the landscaping on the east side is aesthetically appropriate, at some point, if additional grant dollars would become available either through the Federal Infrastructure Bill or other sources, is it possible then that the land to the north that we've talked about that's inappropriate today could be utilized at a future date and tied into the system to create a larger array later to maximize that return on investment without creating something invasive in the neighborhood? Is that a possibility? Or when this is done in the spot that it's done, is it done and it's not available at all? Well, I think we can always expand it, you know, uh, to the north at some point. So if we if we took a, a smaller array than the original one that was presented, um, and 15, 20 years down the road we wanted to expand that, because now the property to the north would be available for us to do that. Um, I, you know, there. I mean, that's assuming could, that the reclamation, our reclamation happens. That the right. land is remediated and appropriate for use, and that the town of Maine would be on board for such a thing. You know, I think that when we look at the next steps here, both of those next steps end at the Common Council, not the Water Commission. And I think it's important to recognize that even though the Commission takes on its own debt and spends its own money, there has to be an approval for the fund source that comes through the Council, not the Commission. Same thing with that zoning. And so, that said, the commission isn't going to make the final decision on any of these options, is that correct? Correct. They'll make a, they'll make a recommendation to council. Okay. And so we have city council members in the room with us tonight, myself included, and so we will have to be, at some point, we're soon here, we're going to be asked to make a decision. We've all heard the feedback that's come from the neighborhood. That said, I think that the water commission should be aware that in any of these scenarios, if there are two alternatives that require no tree removal along Bugby that are more palatable to the neighborhood, and we recognize that the largest array is a non-starter, it's a reasonable assumption that the council will stop the project if they come forward with the largest array. I mean, we, we can see to that. I mean, if we're in control of the money and the zoning, if we, if we knock that down, there's no project. So, you know, just based on the invasiveness of the largest array, even though that has a larger return on investment, if we know that at some point in the future there may be useful land elsewhere, 
that's less invasive to the neighborhood. I think it would behoove the commission to be told as a result of this meeting that they need to focus on either the small or medium alternative and minimize any tree removal along Buckby. That really has been the brunt of the concern that I've heard from residents from the day we started. And the landscape plan for the east side, I think, should be brought to either the Northwest Neighborhood meeting so that there could be additional public engagement with a couple of alternatives. And just to make sure that that screening on that east side is appropriate. But you know, I, I think if the feedback from tonight is going to the commission, they would be well served to rule out that larger story right now and move forward with something smaller that either serves the plant or serves the plant and some additional minimal gain. But, and we know that there are grant funding sources coming available, whether it's ARPA, whether it's federal infrastructure, you know, whatever that might be. And that will maximize that return faster and it will eliminate taking on debt to pay for it. So, you know, I think that's just, hearing everything I've heard here now for the second time in a couple months, and we've talked about it a little bit in our neighborhood meetings, I think that we need to back off of this largest project. That's just where I'm, where I'm at with it. And, you know, knowing that the council will make the final decision, if we can't come up with something that's palatable that minimizes that tree removal, there's going to be a problem on the council floor, I feel like. I second that. Yeah. <laughs> I don't say we're but it, just, just that's the reality of what's happening here is that there's not one one commission or one committee that gets to make that decision. Ultimately, the buck is going to stop with us on the council, and that's why we're here to get the public feedback and hear what you guys feel about this. And if there's an alternative that works. There's no alternative that works that's totally different. But if out of the three, if you guys can live with two of the three and absolutely not the third, then I think it's clear what needs to happen. And I, want, I wanted to lay this out for the community, just, you know, that the processes that still need to go forward. Um, the property does need to get rezoned uh, because the city zoning the way it is right now does not allow a solar array on that property. Um, so this is just one option It would go into a rural holding with a conditional use and that would be at a public hearing to the plan commission and then uh, final approval through the council as well. So, yeah. One other piece of information that is really important to me is I need to know where the panels are made. That's okay. extremely important. Underneath the panels. Yeah. 
Are these pictures online someplace? I, I haven't posted any of these presentations online or anything. The but city? Yeah, absolutely, I can do that. Yep. <clears throat> Yeah, typically at the, our commission meetings, we have the consultant. They'll they'll give some aerial photos from a drone and stuff on the progress and things like that. So if you go to past commission meetings in the packets online, you'll see the pictures. The over current time. ones, I think last week, they weren't current. They were. I, um, yeah, online from the last commission packet, they'll have some some recent photos of what's there now. Is that building now is going to be offices and such too? Is that what I'm understanding? Mm -hmm. The plant, I mean, it's turned from the water treatment facility to offices and garage, and I mean, it's the whole community in there. Really. Co correct, yeah, so we have an admin building where staff is at, you know, to run the plant, all of, all of that, and then we actually have the buildings for the processes, yep. And big garages there, those are? Yep, there's some vehicle storage there as well, yep, for the equipment that they have, yes. Sure, yeah, we had, um, uh, you know, like a meter shop building, we had, you know, different buildings and stuff on that site as well. Yep, the different uses. Was it going um, in or out, or were they building more to the north? I mean, there's big um, trees and stuff there, there's been action over there, there's one of those buildings, I don't know if that was a retention water area or. On the north? Scott, do you know? What they're building something on the north right now? A building oh, they're, or? They're finishing up, they're putting the black dirt on the retention side. The big black pipes went way north by the pond. Oh. That's an overflow pipe for the pond. So the retention pond is there, that's where it is? It is. Yes, sir. For the next future meetings, can we get the stuff up on the projector? So we can see, instead of being 100 feet away from your drawings. Oh, you mean the the drawings? Yeah, they were in the presentation, but um, but yeah, okay. okay. I appreciate everybody showing up, especially um, it's a couple hour meeting, but um, I appreciate the input. Oh, Bob, sorry Bob, yeah, thanks for, Bob had some information and some pictures he wanted to share as well. So there are a lot of great people in this room, and I'm not one of them, I appreciate your, and this joke is musical, that's why it kind of a speech issue. I am kind of fired up about this because I don't think I feel in the same It's not the same balls cutting down trees. Since this involves cutting down trees, I just kind of panic. So, for those of you who don't know what we're talking about, is there's probably two to four thousand trees on Bolivia. Such a beautiful place. And these are the ones that initially we were afraid of. Maybe not true now, but we were initially afraid they were to cut them all down. And that would be a disaster. Oh, I don't want to offend anybody. But Wausau, the city, in my opinion, hasn't always been the best neighbor. Um, when they moved into our neighborhood, they let this happen, right? So what I'm worried about is that <clears throat> Wausau, that what if they do there? Aesthetics means a whole lot to our little corner of the earth there, right? Um, and that's um, it's right across the street from the garden. And uh, so here's what we have to look at. Um, and again, <laughs> I apologize because in my panic, I would get some kind of video up somehow, some way, so that people can see things. 
Okay, so here's where, you know, we're looking at the plant. The flat ground, we would like them to put anything up is over there here in our trees. And that's um, really, really important to us. Another thing with that, that lady on the screen told us is that it doesn't take much to put on a panel. Matter of fact, she was making reference about putting up on farmland. And you can't tell me, I came from a farm. There's not a piece of farmland that would be more sturdy than a pack or apple or whatever else is in there. So I'm not sure that's an accurate statement. Let's play that down here. So here's the current water plant for Wasa, and that's what I'm afraid would happen to this one here. So whatever Wasa does, aesthetics means a whole lot to us. So is this right downtown by the recycle area and so forth? We don't want this in our neighborhood, right? So Wasa, just be very careful to make sure that your class act then is okay. And here is a picture of a solar panel done by Southern Wisconsin done by Westby. This is probably about seven years old. It looks like it's about 50 years old. Uh, these are right on the ground. The good thing about this one, it was built at a farm, uh, 40 acres of farmland, and not in a residential area. So I'm not saying one thing about solar versus the other, but what I am concerned about is that Wasa is really interested in this stuff. Buy a ginseng farm and put three in the acre farm up someplace. Don't put it in our little neighborhood. Um, let's see, that's probably, there's some nice houses and some great neighbors in that neighborhood, and we like it that way. So anyway, just uh, remember the other side of the thing, because what I wanted to kind of bring up more than anything from this thing here, this just means a whole lot the people who live there. Um, it's not just a little panic. Uh, a little, I'm not panicking. The uh, problem is if you're not from the area, or you wouldn't have seen our area, and you wouldn't have seen our terrain, it would mean, wouldn't mean a hill means to you. But because we really are attached to that area, I think it's one of Boss's little secrets. Um, yeah. Oh, here's a picture. We have some. Uh, other neighbors and so forth in the, in the neighborhood that we have from time to time. We want to keep them there. And that was a great idea this spring. Is it here? Yeah. So anyway, thanks for your time. I'm so sorry to jump at the end. But this means a whole lot. Aesthetics means a whole lot. Don't cut that one tree. One tree takes care of eight people for a whole year. And there's two to four other trees in that one little wood. Some of them are 100 years old. The world, uh, the energy conference, it just believed a big deal there was no more deforestation. It was like a number one, number two goal, and so for a loss of deforestation. Is that a deal? <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.